would you like to be driving that baby? Some thrill. But you know, before that pilot could fly from coast to coast in three hours plus, somebody had to invest about a million hours getting him ready for it. There's a lot of designing, testing, and trial runs behind every new innovation or new performance record. How do I know? My name's Carol Shelby, and performance is my business. I guess fast cars have always been an important part of my life. I started driving them on dirt tracks down in Texas. And after a while, I worked my way up to sport car driving. That was it for me. The sport car circuits with their constantly changing conditions offered the challenge of the kicks I was after. Finally, the big win, Le Mans, 1959. And boy, I was sitting on top of the world. Shortly after that, I became a retired race driver and soon learned there's nothing lower than an X-Race driver unless it's a busted X-Race driver. About all I had was an idea. You might even call it a dream. It was to build a sport car that, first of all, more people could own and enjoy driving, and second, that could race under American colors and maybe pride the old established names a little bit. Having practically no capital, I started off. But it was a coincidence, really, that got us going. First, the AC car company in England badly needed a new engine. They produced a good basic chassis and body, but had no engine source. On the other hand, Ford Motor Company over here was just in the development stage of a promising new high-performance engine. Well, after a lot of talking, I got a hold of some bodies from the AC people, and Ford agreed to help me build a new sport car I call the Cobra. The rest is in the record books. The new Ford-powered Cobras beat just about everything in sight to win the U.S. Road Racing Championship in 1963. In 1964, we took our first crack at the World Road Racing Championship with a new coupe body of our own design and a race-proof Ford engine. We took our new Ford-powered Cobra across the pond. And for the first time in a long time, Europe saw American race cars winning. We didn't take the World's Championship the first year, but well, we sure gave Mr. Ferrari something to think about. And that's how it all started. Today, Shelby American is a pretty good-sized business. We're building Cobras for racing and for fun. And our coupes are getting ready for another season and another crack at those red Ferraris. We've got a couple of new entries in our stable this year. The new Mustang-based GT350 and the first American car of its kind, the new Ford GT. This GT350 is a racing version of Ford's Mustang 2 Plus 2. We set the cars up for racing by installing special components, racing shocks and so on. We're doing a lot of testing as well. Here's something else that we're excited about. It's this new Ford GT. It was designed and built by Ford engineers as kind of a laboratory on wheels to test new ideas and prove Ford's capabilities in open competition. We've been given the job of testing this new car and racing internationally. Road testing each new product change Proving out each component part is almost as valuable to the manufacturer and designer as racing itself. This is Willow Springs Raceway, tucked away in the Mojave Desert. It's where we do much of the testing for our new cars. The interesting thing about testing out high-performance automobiles is that you can only do it with top drivers who can take the cars right up to the maximum. We've got with us today Pete Brock, head instructor at our driving school. Pete's behind the wheel of the new Mustang GT350. Coming up is Ken Miles, one of the best sport car drivers in America. The Hawk just doesn't look right unless he's leaning through a turn in a Cobra. And finally, California's presidential candidate, Daniel Sexton Gurney, piloting the new Ford GT. Most people who enjoy motor racing find the more they learn about it, the more they study good driving techniques, the more interesting the sport is to them. I don't know anybody any more qualified to pass along some of these fundamentals than our own Pete Brock. Take over, Pete. Unbelievably, a top driver 
can take a very fast, high-performance automobile. And whether it be Willow Springs Raceway or Le Mans or Sebring, and take this car and run this circuit time after time, lap after lap, and never vary more than a couple of tenths of a second. The whole key to this is something we call the line. It's his old understanding of the circuit, how the corners are banked, what the road surface is, every little variation, how he places the car in there to use it to his advantage. I think the easiest way to illustrate the value of a smooth line is to take a set of corners, vary the lines, and time the results with a stopwatch. This is the only way that a driver can really know how fast he's going. First, let's take the example of the fellow who doesn't use enough road. Because his entry and exit points aren't as wide as they should be, his line won't be flat enough. It won't allow him to put the power on the ground to do the job. First run, 23.2. Another common mistake is trying too hard. Here you can see how much time is lost in spinning tires and sideways motion. Watch the entry, it's going to be too fast. It carries the car beyond its apex, forces the driver to back off and regain bite on his front tires. This will cause him to lose a lot of valuable time. Pretty ragged. Here's how it's done correctly. Fast, wide entry powerful braking while downshifting, positioning the car correctly for the apex. Straighten the line as much as possible to minimize the weight transfer. Perfect. Nice line. quickest production sports car in the world today, the Cobra. Turn one is a constant radius, very fast third gear corner. Ken usually takes it by entering on the extreme outside of the corner. There's a little pavement added out here beyond the original pavement, and you can watch him come clear over on the outside. He brakes, very late downshift, has a late apex in the corner, begins to apply the power and comes out very smoothly all the way to the outside edge of the road. However, you can make a mistake in this type of an entry on a corner by applying your power too soon coming out, and you'll spin it. Now, obviously, Ken did that on purpose. Let's watch the way he always does it. Now, turn two is a constant radius sweeper. Watch Ken's right front wheel as he comes through this corner. You can see the whole corner is strictly throttle application with only slight bits of steering wheel correction to hold him on the line. I think one of the most beautiful things that a driver or a spectator can experience in racing is a four-wheel drift through a constant radius bend like turn two. A great driver will study the circuit the way a golfer will study a putting green. One of the best sections of track to study a driver of the caliber of Dan Gurney and a suspension as sophisticated as that on the Ford GT. It's a very tricky section of the circuit between five and seven that has a crest in the middle of it. Now, as Dan went over the top of that hill, he upshifted, wait till the car settles, got his foot well planted in it, and he's entering an extremely fast area of track right in here. is the car wants to tend to follow its radius and go out in this direction. So the driver has to compensate for it by running very wide, feathering off the throttle, picking a late apex over here, and just finding the right point in the speed where he can cut across his apex and come out. That point is a black tire. Watch Dan cut across the tire and pick up a small puff of dust on the apex, get well into the throttle, looking he heads down toward the start-finish line. That's a winning combination. Dan Gurney and the new Ford GT.
It's turning pretty good out there, Dan. How's it feel? Oh, I like it a lot. It feels like it's really going to go on a long straightaway. Like next year at Le Mans, maybe. It could really be a winner there. That uh, On that three and a half mile straightaway, I bet it'll be doing over 200 miles an hour. Of course, Le Mans is 24 hours. How do you feel about it from the driver's standpoint? Well, that's a long race no matter what kind of a car you're in. But it actually has almost a passenger car environment in there. And uh... All right, you two. That's enough talking. Get out there with Ken and start putting some hours on those engines. Race drivers are all the same. Give them a car and a track, and they'll start running with each other. Of course, these cars weren't designed to compete with each other. They'll run in separate classes. The new Mustang-based GT350 will compete against the E-Type Jags, the Sunbeam Tigers, and Corvettes. Our Cobras will campaign again for the World's Manufacturers Championship, taking on the best Europe has to offer, here and in their own backyard. The Ford GT, after running experimentally last year, now begins its first full racing season with its American debut at the Daytona Continental. We have high hopes for all of these cars this year. We hope that by racing with Ford, we can make this an American year. Very soon now, we'll be racing these cars against the best competition in the world. A lot of work goes into preparing the cars for each separate race. Each circuit's a little different. Daytona, for instance, has bank turns and Sebring's as flat as a pancake. So we set up the cars a little differently, changing spring rates and shock adjustments. Finally, you can't do any more tinkering. The cars qualify for places, and then it's time to put your reputation on the line. You might think there's not much you can do after the start of an endurance race, but remember, we run as long as 24 hours and cover up to 3,000 miles flat out. Cars and drivers take incredible punishment. Fatigue sets in, both human and mechanical. We have to make corrections during pit stops. And we constantly change the driving strategy according to the track conditions and our position with regards to competition. By the middle of the afternoon, the pace is just too hot for some and the field begins to thin out. And now the durability of our engines and components pay off. And we're running one, two, three, four. Twilight, night, and round and round they go. And still, the GTs and Cobras hold up. Finally, one more lap, and then it's all over. And the big board places the overall winner, and yours truly is back in the winner's circle, along with Ford and two great drivers. A month later, it's Sebring, with the noise and confusion of a Le Mans start. Another long day starts. We're running well, even against the special modified sport cars. take their toll and we lose a GT to suspension trouble. And then out of the north comes a downpour you wouldn't believe. And the cars are all over the track. They look more like motorboats than race cars. The rain finally quits, night and the lights flash by.
to the 11th hour and then it's all over. And the Ford GT finishes second overall, its second straight Grand Touring prototype victory. Well, we did all right the first couple of times out. The field of cars were very impressive at Dayton and Seabury. Now we're getting ready for the big ones overseas. Monza, Targa Floria, and Le Mans. In the weeks to come, we hope to continue our string of victories. It's a cinch that whatever success we find, we'll also find our share of disappointments. Motor racing is that way. It's a rich mixture of heartache and joy. For those of us who participate in this most exciting of sports, the Ford people, our crews, drivers, whatever the outcome, racing becomes a never-ending pursuit of excellence. 